All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, it is my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Stephen Weiss from the University of Michigan. Um, Dr. Weiss started his career at The Ohio State University, where he received his BA in Biological Sciences um, and continued on to receive his MD. He then uh, did his residency at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and finally, he moved um, to do his research fellowship at the University of Michigan, um, where he has been ever since. Uh, he has moved up the ranks and is now a full research professor, in addition to being the associate director for basic science research. Um, he holds multiple R01s in his lab um, and has received numerous research awards, which would be here far too long for me to go through all of them. Um, he has over 100 peer-reviewed publications, um, several patents, and is a member of several editorial boards and study sections. Um, he's also invested in a lot of his trainees um, and has served as the director of the postdoctoral research training program at the University of Michigan. Um, and with this fabulous CV, um, I will turn it over to Dr. Weiss to talk about his work looking at um, cancer cell invasion. Thanks. Great, thanks for having me. You guys are already doing better than they do at Michigan, because usually what they do is when they have food like this, the lots of people come, they pick up their food, and then they leave. <laughs> so, what am I gonna tell you about? Well, we're going to talk about some of the research we do. I tend to, uh, as I've been told, to speak very quickly. But I, you know, like these horrible things, like if you ever read Scientific American, where you read the first page and it's like really simple and you get really excited that you're going to understand the article and then you turn the page and then it's like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what they're talking about. This one I'm going to try to keep you along, but it's really not that important what I'm presenting. If you really want to know about it, you have to go read the papers and then you can interrogate me at will. At the end, this is really more about the philosophy of how we make a discovery and then how we pursue that discovery through further research in the different directions that it actually takes us. So, if we begin here, I really don't care if someone's interested in developmental programs like we are in our laboratory. I'm not going to talk about it that much, but if we think of something like gastrulation, which involves massive cell movement and changes in epithelial mesenchymal characteristics, or we think of a neoplastic process like cancer where the tumor cells are going to invade and spread to distant sites in the body. Under both circumstances, the cells have to move. And the question is, what are they actually moving through? And this is where even experts in the field fall short. Because I really go, what do you think all this amorphous stuff really is? So the little... This is probably the only thing important that you'll learn today or to remember. What are we actually made of? I actually run this course for MDs or MD-PhDs that think they might want to pursue an academic career. And I can tell you, in 25 years, everybody always gets it wrong. and go, what are we made of? There's only three things. So usually, everybody gets the first one right. That's cells. The next one, eh, smaller subset get right. Fluids, right? That we have blood or plasma or whatever else. The last one almost everybody misses. The third thing that we're made of is extracellular matrix. This thing outside the cell, it's almost like cloth, the fibrillar material that makes up the bulk of our body. And in fact, if you're one of these people that sort of like biomedical engineering, you know, the big thing now is to decellularize tissues and then use that as a platform or a scaffold to regenerate the tissue. It's pretty amazing. If you take a lung or a heart and just remove all the cells, this little white translucent thing, that is the extracellular matrix. It's the exact shape of the real structure. So almost half the constituents of your body, if we take away the fluids, is really your extracellular matrix. Okay. But if we go back to something like a neoplastic process and think, well, these these famous cartoons where the cell's invading, what does that extracellular matrix really look like when we think about the cell matrix interface? Because every cell in our body, except for the circulating blood cells, are attached to this scaffolding. 
What's it really look like? And almost, I always tell people, even when you're doing experiments or anything else, you want to think in your own mind, what do I think it's going to look like? Because then you, when you see invariably that you're wrong, you actually really learn something about the process. So I always thought, okay, if I imagine what a cell is going to look like, if I'm going to do like a cross-section, a transmission electron micrograph, part of it's going to be a round cell, there'll be a nucleus or something like that. Okay, there'll be something, you know, some kind of fibrillar stuff. What's it really look like? But I'm telling you, even after all these years, this defies imagination. This is the edge of a single pancreatic epithelial cell. It's actually from a human. That's what the surrounding extracellular matrix looks like. It's this unbelievably dense composite of collagens, elastins, proteoglycans, structural glycoproteins, glycosaminoglycans. There are hundreds of different constituents that your cells lay down. So you can imagine if this cell wanted to move or even to divide, this is the sort of matrix that's interfacing with it. It's going to have to actually negotiate. So what's the current feel in the literature? And the bulk of the literature in every field is invariably wrong. What do people really think? They really think there's only two ways that the cell can actually do this. One of them is going to be ah, extracellular matrix remodeling by proteolysis, that there's going to be enzymes in the cell that are specifically designed to clip this material, just like scissors cutting cloth, that will allow the cell to negotiate its way through the extracellular matrix. So if you had a wound and you want to grow new blood vessels into that wounded tissue and the blood vessels are going to have to branch, the argument would have to be those endothelial cells are going to have to remodel the surrounding extracellular matrix and they're going to mobilize proteases to do this. And I don't care if it's an endothelial cell or a neoplastic cell, the basic machinery is the same. Just the regulation isn't going to be the same. But of late, a counter theory has arisen going, no, 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 no. Cells can also remodel the extracellular matrix by exerting mechanical force. The cell's like a little muscle. It can grab a hold of things and pull them out of the way. But I'm sorry. I mean, I always have my own biases, but I might overturn those through experimental work. I'm always very quick to throw out anything that's not consistent with what we find in the laboratory. I still looked at this, and I'm going, guys, if this is a cell, and this is the extracellular matrix, are you telling me, especially when I know many of these materials are covalently cross-linked, you're going to tell me mechanical force is going to distort this? This is just the edge of the cell. The cell's probably this big. You're going to tell me mechanical force is going to do that? I'm just sorry, it just doesn't feel right. And especially if you look at it in, even in a 3D context. This is just a normal fibroblast from skin. This is the kind of matrix that surrounds it. I'm going, boy, this is hard to believe that you're just going to move things out of the way. Again, when we talk about this covalent network. So I sort of had a bias that it's going to have something to do with proteases. We used cartoon, you know, axis molecular scissors. Really, when we're thinking about extracellular proteolysis, you can make these very complex things really simple. There's only two kinds. They're either going to be secreted scissors that the cell just secretes with secretory machinery, or they're going to be membrane anchored. I don't care if they're GPI anchored, transmembrane proteins. They're going to be tethered to the cell surface. So the cell can either mobilize scissors that are secreted or tethered to the cell surface if that's what, if that's what we think is going to work. Now, this doesn't, saying that this is my preferred hypothesis really doesn't do me that much good because we're going, uh-oh. If we look at humans, 566 proteases, at least almost 300 of them are extracellular, either tethered or secreted. Hundreds to think about. Why mice should have even more, I have no idea. I tell you, the longer I do research and the deeper I look, the less I understand. If I knew what I knew now, I, I probably would, <laughs> I don't know what I would do. I'd be working, I told somebody this morning, I'd be working on bacteria, something that it would be more manipulable, and I still would be confounded. But this is where we stood. This is from, I joke with youngers, younger ones among you, this is from last century, like in the 1970s, that you'd almost think people really thought, even when we thought there were only 50 proteases. Now when there's 300, when they go through the mammalian genome, it's almost too complex to ponder, that there's so much redundancy and compensatory mechanisms built into this cascade, there cannot be a handful of these scissors that are so important, that if you deleted, knocked out one of these genes, oh my gosh, 
Look at all the other pathways that will allow you to still negotiate that extracellular matrix barrier. So that was sort of the belief, that even if you thought, okay, for a cell, whether it's normal or neoplastic, to move through the extracellular matrix, it's going to mobilize some sort of proteolytic enzyme that's going to clip things, they'd still go, there is no such thing as a favorite pair of scissors because there's just so much complexity in this system that you're not going to rely on one. Okay. But I'm going to show you a little cartoon. I'm a big fan of New Yorker cartoons. And uh, this sort of, for me, sort of, I don't know, conceptualizes the wrong ways that science, a lot of science goes. So this is the cartoon. Teacher looking down a little kid, the 2 plus 2 equals 5. And the kid's saying, maybe it's not a wrong answer. Maybe it's just a different answer. Guys, I'm not after a different answer. I want to know, if I can, what the real answer is. And if we... I don't care if I worked on a molecule for 20 years. If someone showed me in a piece of work that this is not the critical molecule and there's something over here that looks all the more important, I'm not going to stick to my guns. I will drop mine immediately and move to the next molecule. That's sort of been the defining feature of my career. If I found something and someone overturned it and found something more interesting, I dropped it. If that one turned out to be untrue, I would go back, or I would find something else that's just as important, or more important. But what I'm going to show you to do today is very sobering in terms of an intellectual process, is I'm going to tell you a small group of proteases. This is completely counterintuitive. Perhaps only one dominate all extracellular matrix remodeling and invasion programs. This makes absolutely no sense. But... This is the direction we've been pushed in through our laboratory work. And I can tell you, what have I really been doing for the life, probably the last 10 years? The last 10 years, we've been trying to overturn this working hypothesis. I'm not trying to prove I'm right. I'm trying to prove it is wrong so I can see what other direction I should be moving in because it's just counterintuitive. But it is not as simple as we would like because now we are seeing, that's why I'm saying the complexity is almost, almost overwhelming. I shouldn't even say almost. It is overwhelming. But as one of my good friends down the hall at my, from where I work, he always goes, Steve, uh, a few billion years of evolu evolution is a long time to figure things out. And I think it's true. But we're going to see that the, a single protease may exert much more complex effects on cell behavior than we ever would have anticipated. It's not going to be so simple. There might be one pair of scissors that's really important. And that pair of scissors may just clip something really important in that extracellular matrix. But the repercussions of either allowing the cell to do that or block it are going to be far more complicated, at least than I would have anticipated. Okay, so where do we begin? Okay. Started really simple. I'm going, I don't care. I read everything in the literature. I don't know how many thousands upon thousands of papers I've read. I'm going, I still want to diffuse, dilute their, not distill this down to something simple. I want to try to, desert, to first start out in vitro. Never going to figure this out in vivo. I need some sort of extracellular matrix medic barrier that I can see if a cell can remodel or not. I'm going to have to choose a prototypical cell type, and I really want to embrace an unbiased approach. I am not going to take some sort of preferred candidate look. Okay, so... What are we going to use as our extracellular matrix barrier? It's actually not very difficult, even though the bulk of the literature continues to make this mistake. What barrier did we choose? Type 1 collagen. Why did we choose this? Very simple. It is the most abundant extracellular protein in all mammals, including humans. You have more type 1 collagen than you have albumin molecules. It's triple helical, very complex structure, but it's stabilized by all kinds of intra- and intermolecular crosslinks. So it's all like a spider web. If you pull on one strand, you're going to pull on everything. But it's covalently crosslinked, unbelievably strong, and it's resistant. Kind of makes sense. If this is the basis of the most of your extracellular matrix, it's going to be resistant to almost all forms of proteolytic attack, because otherwise, how are you going to keep your Achilles tendon, your cartilage, skin, and everything else? And actually, if you look in cartilage, its half-life has been estimated about 200 years. It just doesn't turn over. So it's going to resist almost everything. But got to think about this simply. Still, if a cell is going to move, I don't care if it's a normal cell, in a wound, or a cancer cell that wants to move through tissues and metastasize, it's going to have to move through 
type one collagen. And even though it's been engineered to be so resistant, there must be a way of remodeling it. Okay, what cell do I choose? So everybody's gonna think, ah, guy works on cancer, he's gonna choose some cancer cell, but I'm worried. You choose one that's epithelial, mesenchymal, should it be a thyroid cancer, pancreatic, breast, I'm going, I give up. And I'm going, wait, I think everybody's making a mistake. This is how simple it can really become hindsight. I go, I can't believe no one's done this. Why don't we look at fibroblasts? Fibroblasts make the type 1 collagen in the body. Fibroblasts have to remodel collagen during wound healing. Why don't we just figure out how a normal cell remodels the dominant extracellular matrix protein in the body? If I cannot figure it out here, why am I studying when every single cancer cell could be different? Right? A very simple approach, but I'm telling you, thousands of investigators overlook this. My greatest strength, if I have any strength, is that I think very simply, and I don't get confused by overwhelming data. So I'm going, I'm going to look at a fibroblast, I'm going to look at a collagen. So what can I do? Well, you can actually build, if you know your matrix chemistry, you can actually build a three-dimensional model of cross-length. This is very important. We're not going to talk about it today, but most of the literature went the wrong way and made type 1 collagen hydrogels that are not covalently cross-linked, which has nothing to do with the in vivo structure. But you can make structurally intact three-dimensional collagen hydrogels. You can put fibroblasts on top. You can embed them in the middle. And you can actually look to go, can I make them move? And if they move, let's see if I can figure out how do they do it. So this comes to our unbiased approach. So this is something we published in 2004. It has not been overturned 15 years later. I hazard to say it will never be overturned. It was years of work, but this transformed the direction of my laboratory. Because what we did is we took, this is just a collagen hydrogel. The fibroblasts are sitting on top. The collagen is translucent by light if you label it with fluorescent material or rhodamine, you can see, whoa, it's a dense collagen gel. You can do a TEM. These are just fibroblasts sitting on top of this thing. And we have antibodies that will detect collagen that's no longer triple helical that's been degraded. So I'm going, okay, the fibroblasts are sitting there. Can I get them to move? So I just put in a growth factor that's known to be important in wound healing. And oh boy, they left the surface. Those are the fibroblasts five days later invading into the collagen gel. And you can see them by TEM. Now, this is one of these, again, I'm going, okay, what do I think it's going to look like if I take a picture of that, do a confocal micrograph, looking at what the collagen looks like after the fibroblasts invaded? So I thought, oh, you know, it'll be like if my hand, uh, you know, was really warm and I pressed it in a block of ice, there'll be this kind of amorphous structure, you know, of what the collagen is going to look like. Completely wrong. I, uh, to this day, I'm shocked perfect little round tunnels. This is the track that the fibroblasts made as it invaded in. Little round holes invading in, so the fibroblast has moved into that tunnel, and the tunnel is decorated not by mechanically forced displaced collagen, because this antibody only picks up collagen that's been proteolytically clipped. The tunnels are lined by degraded collagen. So somehow, the cell clipped the collagen in order to move through. Okay. Now we're going, yeah, but Steve, there are hundreds of proteases. What are you going to do? So we have very, most of the proteolytic classes fall into four or five, doesn't make a difference, like serine, metallo, serine, threonine, cysteine proteases. I'm going, well, we have some very powerful inhibitors that will inhibit their general, that go against the catalytic domain that will inhibit all of them, basically. Let's just throw them in there. Now, what am I thinking again before I do the experiment? I'm thinking we're going to have a big problem here. I bet you some of these compounds are just going to be toxic to the cell, right? Because they got all those proteases. And the cell's just going to stop invading, not because it used the protease. They're just sick or they're dying. But to our surprise, putting in all these general inhibitors had no effect on this invasion program. The fibroblasts kept invading through. And this is just, you know, where luck favors the prepared mind. We targeted a small class of metalloproteinases known as the matrix metalloproteinases. We had no idea. If we, I thought, oh, it's not going to do anything again. But what did we find? We have synthetic inhibitors. They're called the British biotech-based compounds, or an endogenous hitter called the tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinases. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe nobody did this experiment. These are the fibroblasts. Five days later, the same growth factor is in there. 
Doesn't make a difference what kind of inhibitor I put in. The invasion program completely stopped. And because these inhibitors are both reversible, if I wash them out, because I'm thinking maybe the cell's sick, the cell started invading again. I'm going, oh my gosh. That fibroblast invasion program is being mediated by somebody that belongs to this class of matrix metalloproteinases. It was one of these like, oh boy movements. We could let the thing go for two weeks and not a single cell would invade. Now, of course, you're thinking, yes, but Steve, it's a, this is going to apply to cancer cells and everything else. The answer is going to be yes. It works on everything. So, only problem is, uh-oh, there's like 20-some matrix metalloproteinases. All of them are made as proenzymes. This is true for every proteolytic enzyme. They're made as proenzymes. They have catalytic domains that do everything. Most of them are secreted and have a little tail. And there's a few of them that are transmembrane that are anchored to the cell surface. So the question is, though, well, now what are you going to do? You're going to knock out all 23 or 24 of these, and you better be careful. Maybe you have to may knock them out in combinations. Maybe there's two of them that do the same thing. Three of them, it's like, what am I going to do? But we engineered this thing in a clever way because remember how I told you collagen, triple helical type 1 collagen, is resistant to almost all proteases. We kind of knew, uh-oh, what the answer is going to be because there's only five of these matrix metalloproteinases that will clip triple helical collagen. There's almost no other enzymes in the whole mammalian genome. There's only one more that's not on here. It is a cysteine protease. A cysteine residue is at its active site. It's called cathepsin K, and it's important for osteoclasts that resorb bone. But really, they're the only ones that use it. But for most mammalian cells, these, at least in the mouse genome, these are the five. And the reason why some are in big letters and some are in small letters, the lettering is proportional to their catalytic efficiency. So everybody in the field said, okay, Steve, if it's going to be a collagenase, these are the dominant, most powerful ones. This has to be the answer. Of course, I'm going, guys, you've got to do the experiment. So first I can tell you is, easily, this guy has been miscalled. It's not a collagenase. So now we're down to four. Well, we have all the knockout mice. Guys, look, I use guys gender neutral. Call everybody guys. So, red is collagen. The blue guys are the nuclei of the fibroblasts sitting on the collagen. They're invading and making holes. I'm going to take away all that coloring so we can just look at the holes. Everybody's favorite collagenase, most powerful, is this gene called MMP13 and MMP8. Give me a break. The cells make holes, degrade the collagen. Couldn't care less if I knock them out. We knocked out a bunch of other ones that other people to this day still think are important. They just completely overlook the paper because they're biased by their own research. I'm telling you, I ain't so biased. I'm just telling you, none of those cells could care less. One, one guy we knocked out. This membrane type 1 matrix metalloproteinase, I'm not going to go back, but it's one of the membrane anchored, and it's the least efficient in terms of cleaving collagen. It turns out we knock this thing out, not a single fibroblast would invade. Could let this go for weeks on end. Put MT1 and MMP back in at endogenous levels, just transfect the cell. It marches on its merry way again. This was a paradigm shift. I don't care for the literature. It was a paradigm shift for me. An enzyme that I would have discounted as being the most important turns out to be the critical guy. Now, you still would go, before we go too far, you go, well, what did it clip? I mean, did it clip something on the cell surface? Maybe it clipped an integrin and activated the cell. Maybe it clipped an adhesion molecule. Maybe it clipped a latent growth factor, activated the growth factor, and that caused the cells to invade. Any of those things would be correct. And in fact, if you look at a current review, I'm not going to say, I don't even remember who it is. This is the, I don't want to, well, for lack of a better word, I would say crap. This is the kind of junk that dominates the literature. I work in this field. I'm supposed to be the, the I head the next Gordon conference on metalloproteinases. I know this field right and left. And I'm telling you, I can't even follow this thing. So many different substrates, so many arrows. I'm going, if it is this complicated, I quit. 
But what is the most simple explanation here? Going, guys, if MT1MMP likes to tri- clip triple helical collagen, and triple helical collagen is the most difficult thing to cleave, doesn't this seem like that would be the obvious answer? But of course, no one would embrace this. They still don't. But I'm going, look, there's a simple experiment. It's what you have to do in these kinds of things. You do a knock-in experiment. Look, I'm not going to target MT1MMP. What if I take the collagen molecule? I know exactly where in the sequence it clips type 1 collagen. What if I mutate the residues around the cleavage site and go, let's go see if the cell can invade? If the cell is activating an integrin or activating a growth factor, it couldn't care less that I mutated the collagen cleavage site. So if I put my little fibroblast on top of red collagen, you just don't see the cell here, makes a big hole, and if we do a transverse section, you'll see it's invading. Okay, what if I put on collagen that it cannot cleave? So it's just a few little mutations around the active site where it likes to clip, and oh boy, the cell's stuck. But they absolutely cannot invade. So this is a classic knock-in experiment if you're interested in a protease target thing that you mutate the target and show the protease can no longer clip, and guess what? The cells can't invade. So at least for the present time, we would have to say minimally that collagen is a critical substrate that must be cleaved to drive the invasive program. I just can't say that's the only thing that MT1MP, because that would be overstating. Okay. So you're all thinking, I'm sure, after the postprandial pizza glaze, what about carcinoma cell invasion programs? I mean, Steve, that's just a fibroblast. Who cares about fibroblasts in the current literature? Everybody wants to know cancer. Okay. So we're going to jump up to the current times. We take a mouse, syngenetic mouse model of breast cancer we'll talk about some more. We put them in our three-dimensional hydrogels, and we stimulate them with a growth factor. And what do we find? Oh, wow. The little tumor organoid that was like our little round sphere you'll see in a minute, they start invading into the collagen very, very nicely. What if I target the MT1MP? No synthetic inhibitors, no whatever else. This is actually a model where we flocks the MT1MP gene. We deleted it in vivo. I'll show you later. We deleted it in vitro. What happens when I take it away? Oh, boy. Those little tumor organoids, they just stay as a little three-dimensional structure, and there's really basically no invasion whatsoever. And not going to go through it in any detail, but if we put MT1MP back in, this is just looking at it under a phase Micrograph where the control is starting to invade. This guy just stays round with no MT1MP. If I put MT1MP back in, they start invading like there's no tomorrow. So guys, it works. Fibroblasts, and not too surprisingly for someone like me, don't tell me carcinoma cells that just have a few regulatory schemes that have been altered, have engaged a completely new proteolytic program in order to invade. They're just using the basic program that normal cells use. It's just inappropriately regulated now. Okay, wait, but what about human? Now, a lot of people like to say, oh yeah, mouse, human, why do I have to worry about it? This is one time that you do have to worry about it, and why is that? I don't really understand this. People give me explanations. This is where the collagenase likes to clip collagen to generate these fragments, but there is something very distinct about human that is not true for the mouse, and this was a possible critique of our work. The dominant matrix metalloproteinase in humans that clips type 1 collagen is appropriately called MMP1 because it was the first one ever discovered in humans. Mice do not have it. It's the weirdest thing in the world. Human MT1MMP, the one we like, and mouse MT1MP, they're like 90% homologous in terms of sequence and protein sequence or at the RNA level as well. But for a crazy reason, something to do with how chromosomes split, I don't really get it. But humans make this, the mice do not. So the argument was, is great, Steve. MT1MMP is probably really important for mouse fibroblasts, maybe even mouse carcinoma cells, but it is not going to be the dominant player. And a powerful force in the field, this is from the Massagay group, they had actually said, oh, If we look at human breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer cells, and we looked to see how they might be invading, oh, look, 
the genes that come up are human MMP1 and this other one called human MMP2. And they think, to this day, even though it was, well, not published that long ago, they still think these are the dominant guys. For me, they're completely ignoring literature. I don't care if mine, there's a million things in there, but they're just not experts in the field. So, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to take their cell. And I'm going to go take their human breast cancer cell. We got it from their lab. I'm going to go target. Instead of saying there's a correlation, I'm going to target MMP1. I'm going to target MMP2. And I'm going to target my guy, MT1MP. And look, if it's MMP1, I'd be the first one to switch gears. But, of course, I wouldn't go through that soliloquy, an introduction, if he was really right. So what do we do? We make a, take of our type 1 collagen. We make a little organoid from a hanging droplet. We embed it in the collagen, and we watch it invade. So what's it look like? That's the human carcinoma cell. It's like a few thousand cells on a little ball. We drop them in the collagen so they're embedded in it. Wow. Wait five days later. It's like a starburst pattern. These are the cancer cells invading into the surrounding collagen structure. So they really can move at blistering speed. But target M. MMP1, MMP2, we've done this CRISPR-Cas9, this was done a while ago, we did sRNA, originally target them both. It makes absolutely no difference. What happens when you target MT1, MMP? Whoa. They are not moving at all. Put MT1, MMP back in a sequence where the sRNA can't target anymore, they invade again. You're going, it's, I'd like to make it more complicated, but I hate to say it, it's this simple. Okay, can you bring us up to date with CRISPR-Cas9? <laughs> you get exactly the same thing. Here's an MDA-231 organoid. Here's the control invading, whether we do it fluorescently or look at the thing by phase contrast. This is all sitting in three-dimensional type 1 collagen. And target MT1 MMP, no invasion whatsoever. Okay, have anything that you could study this in vivo and really look at it nicely? It's a very simple model. It was actually developed in the 30s, very powerful, that you can take a chick embryo and you can inject tumor cells and they'll actually extravasate, they will actually engage an angiogenic response and you can actually watch your tumor cells grow. It's immunoincompetent, so you can do the whole experiment. So we've done this model. These are what the blood vessels look like in the chick. You can do something called second harmonic generation. This is showing that the blood vessels are surrounded by a heavy coat of type 1 collagen. So you're going, okay, let's go inject the same breast cancer cells that Massagay uses, and we'll just target or not target MT1 MMP. This is what it looks like if you don't target it. So we injected them in the blood vessel. These are all tumor cells. It's amazing. I don't know why this works so well. They extravasate from the blood vessel. They cross the blood vessel. They're in that type 1 collagen-rich thing. They start proliferating. The cancer cells are red, the triple negative breast cancer. And they actually wrap around the blood vessels just like you see in humans. And they start proliferating. And you can actually, I'm not going to show you here, if we keep looking at the green, the chick actually mounts an angiogenic response to sort of feed the cancer cells to grow. What happens when you target MT1 MMP? It's like, oh my gosh. The tumor cells still cross the blood vessel, but they cannot grow at all. They are paralyzed. So it really looks like this is the critical feature. Now, how does this stand for the current literature where people think MT1 or these other MMPs are so damn important? Well, all I can tell you is, at least from my bias, uh, not bias, I go by the data, we can't implicate any of these guys. So it really looks like MT1 MMP is the dominant player for driving this invasion program by itself. Now, people always ask me, especially when I chair the Gordon Conference, they're going, Steve, are you saying that all other MMPs have no function whatsoever? You're saying yours is important, everybody else's has no importance. Of course not. Well, of course I am, but I'm not going to tell them that. <laughs> but really, I think these things do do other things just a partial list, but they are not actually participating in the invasion program. They have other functions. It's just nobody knows. I tell you, to this day, no one knows what they really are. Okay. So what do we know about MT1MP in terms of its structural requirements? I just want to tell you, this has like been a long story that we just keep on going, but we first were wondering, wait a minute. All these enzymes are made as proenzymes. They're latent. 
who activates MT1 MMP? I mean, it can't be doing anything if it's dead. Something has to be clipping off the pro-domain or distorting the structure of the pro-domain, how it wraps around the catalytic domain to drive this invasion program. And a very clever postdoc in the lab, Duan Chinpei, who's now back in China, he discovered that when MT1MP goes from the ER to the Golgi, that first time this has ever been found, that an intracellular protease is actually being activated inside the cell by an enzyme that sits in the trans-Golgi network called furin. And it notices a little sequence of basic ARG, X, lyse ARG amino acids, clips there, and the active MT1MMP is then brought to the cell surface where it can function. So we knew how it was activated. We've done some very simple, I'm going to show you sort of an overview of structural studies, because it, it does have a tail, it does have a transmembrane domain, but we have done experiment, and it's supposed to activate other MMPs, but we've eliminated all these things. We've deleted the tail. We swapped the transmembrane domain. Everything you can possibly, we've actually now, we haven't published it yet, we've made knock-in mice with all these mutations. But the finding is pretty simple. Wild-type MT1MP expressed in a cell will make a hole. If you delete the tail, even though it does have some function, the thing is still active. And actually, uh, several groups have now published papers, even though we talked about this before, where they, they are arguing that the tail is absolutely critical for MT1MMP function because it binds to actin through all these binding domains, and that's what allows it to go to its correct place on the cell surface. And we're going, guys, we've deleted the tail. It still works. I don't know how they ignore this stuff. But the one thing that is interesting, even though... We can make mutants of the enzyme where it can be secreted from the cell surface, just not tethered to the cell surface. So it's fully alive. It doesn't work anymore. It's still a collagenase, but it seems, and it comes clear later, that the cell must have this tethered on the cell surface and place it exactly where it wants to dig. If it just throws it out into the medium, it'll degrade collagen in a random fashion, but will not support the invasion program. I'd say the easiest way to thinking about that is if you were trying to dig a little tunnel that you could crawl into, you'd have to have the shovel in your hand and dig just right so your hands could still stay on the edge of the tunnel and your feet could give you some purchase. If I just threw the shovel at random directions, I'm not going to create the sort of tunnel that I need to go actually walk through. So the enzyme seems to work the same way. Okay, how do they mobilize this proteolytic activity? More than you're ever going to want to know, but since I'm here and I didn't get in until 3.30 in the morning, there was a big snowstorm and you're trapped. <laughs> I'll tell you more than you're going to know, want to know. MT1MP is actually made in the ER, comes out of the Drans-Golgi network in these complicated little vesicles that actually we haven't published any of this. So part of what I'm telling you about, 70% of what I'm telling you has never been published yet. Not, not that I haven't tried, it just hasn't been published yet. <laughs> but the MT1MP traffics in these little vesicles to the area where the cell would like to degrade. Now, many of you know MT1MP... And like much of the invasive machinery wants to go in these structures called invadopodia. And they're supposed to be decorated with things like MT1MP and involved molecules. I can't even keep all this straight. But how does everybody really look at this? The common way is they put cells on a cover slip coated with gelatin, because MT1MP will degrade gelatin. Gelatin is, if there's anybody here that's a vegetarian, they will know that gelatin is just denatured cow or pig collagen. So collagen is a triple helical molecule. If you heat it up to past 56 degrees centigrade, it unfolds. And horribly, that's the stuff that's making up in your yogurt, in jello. In jello. I'll never touch jello again. It's denatured collagen. So you put a little coating of this, and you can watch the cell form little actin-rich areas where they're going to degrade the underlying gelatin. And that's the invadopody. But you're going, wait a minute. This is not, cells don't, aren't looking for gelatin, and they're not sitting on a rigid glass substratum. What's it look like if the cell's trying to invade a physiologic three-dimensional structure? So this is what it really looks like. We haven't published this. It's interesting for me. So we just put some tumor cells on top of collagen, and we just look to see, first, 
Where's the MT1MP? So if I look underneath, I'm looking this way, you can start to see holes forming in the collagen. And where is the MT1MP in those little vesicles? Ooh, it's trafficking right to where the holes are. But it's still not showing you what do those little invadipodia look like. So I'm still thinking it's just going to be, I don't know, what am I thinking? I'm thinking it's like, you know, like a hot BB going through butter. It's going to be the bottom of the cell is coated with MT1MP and there'll be just something. Completely wrong. If we look at this, this is a cell sitting on collagen, which is green. These are the little actin spikes where the invadipodia are actually invading. If we then take away the cells and just look at the actin, this kind of bizarre kind of structure, I'm going, okay, I still don't understand. What if I try to look at this in three dimensions? This is what the cell is really. So the cell's up here. This is the collagen. It really looks like tentacles from an octopus. It's this unbelievably complex series of invasive little fingers, nothing that I would have imagined being inserted into the collagen. I'm not going to go through everything, but yes, they are decorated with MT1MMP. This is how a single cell is actually invading. Putting these tendrils in, degrading the collagen, they kind of coalesce, and the cell seems to traffic in. Well, where is this... MT1MP coming from. I just spent three months in Paris working with a competitor, in a way, Philippe Chavrier, who believes that MT1MP comes to the cell surface, this is a bizarre kind of trafficking program, is then internalized, it then goes to recycling endosomes, and then it goes to the invadipodia. I'm going, really? <laughs> This really seems kind of weird. I mean, can it just go from the trans-Golgi directly into the invadipodia? And I'm not saying it's the only pathway, but I think it is the dominant one. And there's a really simple trick that you can use. So this virus, vesicular stomatitis virus G protein. And people have made some really interesting temperature-sensitive mutants where what you can do is you can do it whoops, at 40 degrees and it gets trapped in the ER. You can switch to... 15 degrees, and it'll move into the Golgi. And then if you warm it up to 32 degrees, one hour later, you can watch it leave the trans-Golgi network and go right to the cell surface. So I'm going, okay, what if I put this VSVG protein in? It's going to go trans-Golgi. I'll do the temperature manipulation. Let's see if VSVG goes directly to Invadipodia. And of course, with that preamble, interesting one is right there. It goes right in. So MT1MMP, and we show in more data, MT1MMP goes directly from the trans-Golgi network directly into these little feet and starts to degrade. Well, who regulates its trafficking? Well, luckily for me, my next-door neighbor at the institute where I am is an expert in insulin GLUT4 trafficking, where it turns out that GLUT4, a glucose transport molecule, which is critical for bringing in glucose in response to insulin, lives in a little vesicle. It's decorated by these guys called the exocysts. It's a series of eight proteins that either decorate the vesicle or the membrane, bring them together to allow the vesicle to fuse with the membrane. So you go, Steve, I can't believe. How come you're not looking to see if your MT1MMP positive vesicles are decorated with exorcist components. And I'm not going to go through everything, but I'm going to tell you. Again, it's not published, but it's not that important. Here is the MT1MP in those little fingers, and so are the exorcist components. This really is the driver. Other people have suggested the same thing, but they think the exorcist is important from taking the cell from one of those lysosomal compartments to the cell surface, and we do not agree with that. We think it's directly from the trans-Golgi to the cell surface, but the reason we really did this is we want to know who regulates the system. And there's a very interesting family of small GTPases called the RALs, RAL-A and RAL-B, and at least in insulin trafficking, RAL-A seems to be the critical GTPase that regulates this whole exorcist family. And with our friend's help, Alan Saltil, we actually found out here's MT1MP inside our cells in these little tubular vesicle compartment. Here's RAL-A, and most of the MT1MP is actually decorated directly by RAL-A. And what happens if we block RAL-A? Well, you can do these cute experiments. This is the MT1MMP inside the cell. The green is the collagen. These are the vesicles moving into the invadipodia to fuse and dock with the underlying collagen layer. But if you put in the dominant negative RAL-A, 
the little vesicles get close but cannot bind to the plasma membrane, do not deliver their MT1 MMP to the underlying collagen and fail to degrade. So this RAL-A axis works. You can get more complicated and like all GTPases, there are activating RAL-GEFs, there are inactivating RAL-GAPs. We've identified all the critical ones and they all regulate MT1 MMP. So our little summary at this point is, TGN and beta-podia from the trans-Golgi seems to be a dominant thing in paracellular proteolysis. The Rale exorcist axis is really important here, and this we think this is the system that's really controlling how much MT1 MMP comes to the cell surface. So we think it really is the dominant paracellular collagenase, but people always ask me, no, 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 Steve, this cannot be right. I mean, to this day, no matter what we publish, they always say the same thing. Come on, Steve. Matrix metalloproteinase from 2002. It's still quoted like there's no tomorrow. Matrix metalloproteinase inhibitors failed in all clinical trials. Steve, if this is so important in human cancer, how can it be they spent billions of dollars developing these drugs, giving them to patients in the 80s, and they all failed to stop anything? What's the problem? So people think, oh, they're not that specific, off-target effects. Oh, my gosh. The explanation is so much simpler. If you go through the clinical data, it's easy to find out what was the peak plasma concentration that they ever got in a patient. Not, not the trough, because this is just right after you give the drug. What's the highest you could ever get? And you'd ask a very simple question that nobody did. Why don't I take that peak plasma concentration and put it in with some cancer cells that are embedded in 3D collagen and see if it blocks? You're not talking about over a year's time, just over a few days. So, of course, we did that experiment. Huh. These are the little cells in 3D collagen. This is just a little cartoon of it. Here's the cell invading in that starburst pattern. This is the peak plasma concentration. It doesn't do anything. The only thing that really inhibited is like 20 times higher than they ever got in any patient. Concentrations you could never use. So what's the simple explanation for why this drug failed in the clinical trials? It's because you cannot get high enough concentrations in humans to block a membrane-anchored protease that's pressed right up against its substrate. It's that simple. So you can't use this to go, okay, all right. So you're thinking now, come on, we've been publishing stuff on this for a while. The whole literature must be completely convinced by all these papers we published. Au contraire, nobody believes it. So, what's my little proof? I don't care what anybody thinks at the end of the day. So, here's MMPs by the number. If you just do a Google search, this is now a couple years old, it's even worse now. The two MMPs that are quoted the most times are MMP2 and MMP9. I just checked a couple weeks ago, it's like 50,000 publications now. Okay, here's all the other guys. Where is MT1 MMP? Oh my gosh, we are in last place. <laughs> How can this be? It's just most people want to keep on working on the same thing. Now, of course, I'm a clever guy, so I'm really thinking here, they're all wrong, but this is how you're supposed to be thinking if you're a real scientist, right? They're all wrong, the delicate balance. Yes, it could be really teeny letters. Perhaps I am wrong. And actually, I always tell people in my laboratory, what's the big difference between me and the people in my lab? It's really simple. They always think they're right. I always assume I'm wrong. I have more experience. Usually, we are wrong. So this is why we go to such extent. But in this case, how do I know I'm right without doing anything more? Guess what? You'll never see this in any review article because I don't like to write reviews. Every MMP has been knocked out in mice. Everyone. MMP2, MMP9, MMP8, MMP13. Everybody thinks, oh, these all have lethal, horrible phenotypes. All the mice, viable and fertile, even double knockouts. Only one exception, and of course, what is that? MT1 MMP. This is what the mice look like 10 days after they're born by three weeks, 100% dead. It is the only MMP out of all 20 some, knock it out, not a single mice will live, not a single mouse will live more than three weeks. It is lethal. Now again, we'll go a little bit over, but what the hell, I'm having fun. 
My friend that's down the hall from me is the geneticist that doesn't like any preferred kind of experiment. He goes, Steve, this might be true in mice. This cannot be right. I have the best unbiased way of looking. I can't, I think it's the exact project or something like that. There's this thing where they've now sequenced somewhere in one of the Norwegian countries, a hundred thousand, it was published a couple of years ago in Nature, a hundred thousand normals looking for, we're going to identify critical genes by looking for, since everybody's fine, what genes do we look at that we don't even see a single mutation even in the het population? If you can see a het mutation that's inactivating, then you'd say this gene cannot be so critical for normal human function. But if you find none, it means that this thing, normals don't even like to inactivate one of the alleles. You go, Steve, completely unbiased. I'll just do a little search on all the MMPs in humans. Let's go find out where MT1 MMP sits. It is the number one. It's 99% of people don't even have a single mutation in it. So they're going, this is one that really looks like in an unbiased approach, there are no humans with either HET or null mutations in MT1MP. So we know we're on the right track. The only thing that makes this unbelievably complicated is, is it basically affects every target organ you can think of. For reasons to this day, nobody even knows why the mice die. But the, one of the reasons we knew that no one really believed us is, Steve, you got mouse experiments, chick experiments, human knockouts, all kinds of stuff. But I want to see proof that MT1 MMP is regulating an invasion program in vivo, in a live animal. So, off we go. What did we decide to study? We decided to study branching morphogenesis of the mammary gland. Because the mouse, at four weeks of age, the female mice launch this controlled invasion program where you're going to form ducts in the tissue. And it's really an amazing thing to see. This is just the lymph node. This is what an early gland looks like at two weeks after the mouse is born. Four weeks, the little pink things, this is the branching program of ducts. That's at four weeks. And by eight to nine weeks, it's full of them. Those ducts have to move through the extracellular matrix. No one has ever figured out, is this protease dependent, independent? Even if it was protease dependent, who does it? And like I said, they're still going to go through this very complex matrix. How do they do it? So the first thing we want to know is, do they make MT1 MMP? So we have LAC-Z knock-ins. We've knocked in a LAC-Z into one of the alleles because there are no great antibodies for mouse MT1 MMP. And whoa, it really lights up the duct. If you just stain, look for the LAC-Z with a beta galactic, the beta galactosase with a stain. So you're going, wow, the ducts really are making MT1 MMP. We must be on the right track. Even though we know it's not a good experiment, we'll still look at the global knockout just to see what's going on. So this is a HET at two weeks. There's a lymph node. There's the beginning of the little branching program. If we look in the knockout, the gland's much smaller, but it looks okay, kind of the same. What if we wait a little bit longer? Well, at four weeks, the control is already starting to branch, and the knockout, whoa, it doesn't branch at all. It's not proof, but if it did branch, I'd be going, we're working on the wrong guy. But it did block, so at least we're going in the global knockout. We just don't know what's going on here. So we launched this in program to really look at this more carefully. Now, i got to tell you, there is a literature that says, and it's, not, it's like FAC, focal adhesion kinase, some people are arguing MT1 MMP because it's transmembrane, it has a tail, things can dock to the tail, it has protease independent functions that could be just as important, and we just succeeded in making a knock-in mouse. So it's carrying a point mutation in the catalytic domain that it's there, it just has no activity, and guess what? It also fails to branch. So it has something to do with proteolytic activity, at least. Okay. What about all these other MMPs that people think are so important? Not going to go through them, but even in today's literature, you'll still see everybody thinks MMP2, MMP3, MMP13, because MT1MP can activate all of these things. They have absolutely no defect. So again, it keeps looking even in vivo. It is MT1MP. So what are we going to do? 
First, we're going to go see how about in vitro. What if I take a little, tumor, a little organoid of the epithelial cells and buried it in three-dimensional collagen? That's a day zero. This is from a normal mammary gland. It really is amazing. You can't see it very well at this resolution. I don't know what's going on, but it's okay. They form beautiful branching networks, even though it's ex vivo. These are just normal epithelial cells in collagen form these branching networks. And if we take the MT1MP knockout, it doesn't work at all. It doesn't branch. So we're going, okay, we figured the whole thing out. All we have to do now is, we're in this this far, make a conditional knockout. Knock out MT1MP just in the mammary epithelial cells, and we're going to show it has a complete defect in branching. So we have Crees, I'm not going to go through it, that very nicely target the mammary epithelial cells and going, uh-oh. So this is the floxed animal, and this is where we've expressed the Cree to delete the MT1MP in the mammary epithelial cells. Uh-oh, it looks normal. But we know it can branch more, so we look a little bit later, and we're going, okay, this is at eight weeks. What about our knockout? Oh, my gosh, it looks the same. This is horrible. I've just knocked out MT1MMP in mammary epithelial cells, in vivo. They make MT1. They branch in 3D collagen. But I knock it out in vivo, no effect. Now, what some people know is you'll never get 100% of the cells deleted with any kind of Cree. So we thought, what if, you know, 5% of the cells escape? Maybe they are leading the charge, you know, as an advancing cell, and the other ones just follow. So we thought of a very good experiment to test that. We made an animal whose epithelial cells are green. It's a wild type. But we're going to take here, we're going to take a green and the knockout. We're going to take the epithelial cells from a green animal. And what we're going to do is we're going to transplant that. We're going to take away the normal epithelial cells in a wild type mouse and transplant in the green knockout epithelial cells. So this is completely biased against us. This came from an animal that's sick because it's a global knockout. We're transplanting it now into a wild-type animal, but one thing is for sure, 100% of those cells have no MT1MP. There is no partial excision of the Cree. So we did the experiment thinking, okay, this is going to show us we're right. So this is the control. It's amazing. That's the little transplant. You wait like a month or so, that little thing that you transplanted forms this beautiful network of branching structures. What happened when we transplanted the 100% knockout epithelial cell? Oh, Lord. <laughs> it branched like there's no tomorrow. So your favorite hypothesis to sort of get around what's the problem in our work, that there's a few cells that miss getting Cree and they led the charge, completely wrong. MT1 and P pays no role in the branching morphogenesis. And if we actually isolate the knockout cells, it isolates a subset of genes that I've never even heard of. I have no idea what MT1MP is doing. How can this be? How can it be that everything that we do in vitro suggests that MT1 is so important, but in vivo, at least in the normal gland, it fails? What are we missing? What is everybody missing? Well, we sort of knew the answer that every epithelial cell in the normal gland, it does not touch type 1 collagen. This is the epithelial cell. That's type 1 collagen. There is another structure that intervenes between the two, and it's called the basement membrane. It has no type 1 collagen. It is rich in type 4 collagen. So when someone even has a carcinoma in situ, it means that the cancer cell is sitting above the base membrane. This thing's only 300 nanometers thick. If the cancer cell eats through that and then hits the underlying structure, and they're in the collagen now, that's when prognosis starts to fall. So if these cells never see type 1 collagen, then we're probably targeting the wrong cell. So where do we look? So you don't really care about this. We even got more nervous here, going, wait a minute. Who says branching? This is a normal process that's been evolved in the female mammary gland. Maybe there's some trick for the branching structures to move through this dense extracellular matrix, and it has nothing to do with proteolysis at all. Who says that any branching program requires proteolytic activity? And lucky for us, a colleague developed a very 
interesting technique of taking a triple a collagen mimetic peptide that it looks like collagen, but it will insert into any collagen molecule that's been degraded to try to recreate the triple helical structure. And when we applied this, we found out, indeed, that as the normal mammary gland was invading into the collagen, it really was degrading the collagen. So there really is a proteolytic event going on here. So now you're sort of stuck with, with, well, who's doing this proteolysis if it's not the mammary epithelial cell? Well, it turns out that the mammary epithelial cell has a base membrane, but around that, it's surrounded by stromal cells like fibroblasts. We started thinking maybe everybody is looking at the wrong cell population. The duct is moving, but maybe they're not degrading. It's the surrounding cells that are remodeling the matrix that allows the duct to advance. And a long story short, this one we did publish. We're not going to go through all this, but... If we just target not the, the MT1MMP in the, fiber, in the epithelial cell, just the surrounding fibroblasts, here again is the degraded collagen around the advancing duct, but if we targeted the fibroblasts, it almost completely disappears. So during the branching program, it's the static fibroblast that seems to be remodeling the surrounding matrix. Well, what happens if I target that fibroblast population and look at branching? So this is a control mouse, this is a heterozygote mouse where we've targeted not the epithelial cells, the surrounding fibroblasts. Everything is normal. There's the lymph node. There's the branching structure. But if we target the surrounding fibroblasts, even at four weeks, there is no branching. What if we wait longer? Well, these guys branch like there's no tomorrow. It completely prevents the branching program. So in this case, counterintuitive, it's the fibroblast surrounding the extracellular matrix or the, the branching duct that's degrading that allows the cell, the epithelial cells to passively make their way through. So what is it really doing to allow the cell to go through? Does it have anything to do with the extracellular matrix? So we decided to look. So this is the amount of collagen that normally surrounds a duct in vivo. This is what it looks like stained with this little red stain. That's the collagen. What happens if I knock out MT1MMP in the fibroblast? Oh my gosh, this immense structure of collagen because the cell is supposed to degrade it. If it doesn't degrade it, the collagen just keeps building up and the branching program comes to a halt. And you can even do this by TEM. This is all, these little guys here are collagen molecules, these little black things. This is how much is deposited if we just target the fibroblast. So the fibroblast is supposed to remodel the collagen in order to let the cell go. But now you still have the experiment we had in vitro. It just shows how you can turn this all around. Wait a minute, Steve. MT1MP could be targeting lots of things in vivo other than collagen. Can you really prove that MT1 clipping collagen Type 1 collagen is the critical thing behind the branching program. And the answer is yes. We're going to go back to that knock-in collagen mutant that I talked about hours ago in the beginning of the talk. Right? What if I take a mouse that we've made the mutation in the collagen molecule so it can't be clipped anymore? What happens to the branching program? Well, here's the control. This is if we make the collagen invulnerable to MT1MMP-dependent collagenolysis. It almost completely ablates the program. So what we see from this is, we're almost done, that stromal cell MT1, degrading type 1 collagen, is controlling the, morphogenesis, the branching morphogenesis. So you'd think, oh, come on, what about cancer? Is it going to be the same thing? Is it going to be cancer-associated fibroblasts, this hot topic in the cancer field that's allowing cancer cells to invade and metastasize? So we launched another study where we used this oncogenic model called, called this model called the polyoma middle T that you can get a really aggressive breast carcinoma model that actually in 100% of the mice will metastasize to the lung. So it's a very powerful system. What if I target MT1MMP here? Well, first thing I want to make sure is, are the cancer cells making MT1MP? So again, we use our LAX-Z knock-in. Tons of MT1MMP being made by these carcinoma cells. Well, if I target MT1MP in the cancer cell itself, not the fibroblast yet, it didn't do anything to growth. But what did we find? It's much different from the branching program. You still go, wait, Steve, all these high-impact papers 
about protease independent invasion, who says the carcinoma cell has to degrade anything in the extracellular matrix in order to invade? There's no proof whatsoever. And in fact, this dominates the current literature that protease independent is how the cancer cells move through, and they actually quote the failure of the metalloproteinase inhibitors to work in clinical trials as proof that this must be the most important thing. But guess what? This is using that special collagen mimetic protein. We find out that the carcinoma cells are degrading type 1 collagen as they invade, and if we knock out MT1 MMP, it's almost like the whole program stops. But what does it do for invasion? That's what we really care about. So these are the tumor cells. This is muscle. The tumor cells, now we've engineered the mouse that the carcinoma cells are red. They're leaving the main tumor here, and they actually invade into the surrounding muscle. So they're doing this by, at the same time, they are using MT1 and P to clip collagen. What happens when we block the MT1 and the carcinoma cell alone? You can see the tumor edge is now, instead of serrated, very, very smooth. We cannot find any invasive cells locally or in the surrounding muscle. Now, people ask me, wait, what about the fibroblasts? Because this is such a big thing. This is a review that just came out in Nature Reviews in 2019. If we target the fibroblasts, it does absolutely nothing. So the same fibroblast that blocked branching morphogenesis for the carcinoma cell that leaves the base membrane is invading, it's carrying all the necessary machinery on its own to invade. But, come on, Steve, if the cell's invading, is it metastasizing? So it's very interesting. If we knock out MT1 in the carcinoma cell, we look for circulating tumor cells. They're almost completely gone. If we look in the lung where the carcinoma cells are red, you can see huge numbers of carcinoma cells have left the primary site and invaded into the lung and are beginning to grow. In the knockout, there's only a few, and actually those aren't carcinoma cells. It turns out those are a few lymphocytes that express this Cree driver. And most importantly, if we look for metastasis, it's like 100% inhibited when we knock out MT1 and MP. And actually, if you look at the mice... That's what the lung metastases look like in these spontaneous metastasis model. If we just target MT1 and P in the cancer cell alone, that's what the mice look like. So the primary tumor grows, nobody makes it to the lung. It's unbelievable, such a strong phenotype. Okay, so what about humans? You can't do this in humans, but lots of people say, oh, MT1 MMP really correlates with overall survival of breast cancer patients. So, of course, we've done the required, even though it's not perfect, PDX experiment. This is from a PDX for a human breast cancer early passage growing in a mouse. We take the tissue out. It's making tons of human MT1 MMP. We actually have, you can put it in three-dimensional collagen and watch them invade and branch but we have an antibody that's directed against the catalytic domain of MT1 and MMP. What happens if we use that? It almost completely blocks the invasion program. So we think it's going to be true for humans. So almost done. Yep. So stromal cell MT1 might be important in branching morphogenesis in the controlled program, but the carcinoma cells that are not normal anymore, they're going to use MT1 and MP on their own to invade and metastasize to distant sites. So... Is it also simple? No. Because guess what? Since we knew the primary tumor from a wild type and the primary tumor where we just knocked out MT1P, they grew the same rate. We showed a pathologist. They, go, they looked the same. I'm going, let's go do transcriptional profile of the primary where we have MT1, and we don't. Well, maybe we'll find some new targets. right? Because the only real difference is they, they just don't invade. Uh-oh. It's like a 1,000 gene changes at the primary site. And they fall into heaven knows how many class. We didn't put this in the paper because they'd say, what's going on here? Obviously, targeting MT1 MMP in that primary tumor did much, much more than we would have anticipated. It isn't just block invasion. What is going on? So we think we kind of know. 
So one of them is a portion of my lab works on mesenchymal stem cell generation. And what they had discovered was if we take a mesenchymal stem cell and put it in three-dimensional collagen, it will activate its beta-1 integrin, turn on the rho rock cascade, and actually exert tractional forces on the surrounding collagen. And if you knock out MT1 and MP, oh, guess what? They can't exert force. They don't activate their beta-1. They don't turn on all this machinery for exerting traction. Why do we care? Because in the field, exerting tractional forces and making stress fibers is supposed to turn on this very important system of the hippo pathway called the YAP-TAS family that turns on thousands of genes. So we're going, wait a minute. Maybe cancer cells are using MT1 MMP to exert tractional forces and start changing transcriptional programs, just as we published in our work in mesenchymal stem cells. So I'm not going to go through this. I'm just going to tell you, huh, this is a potential mechanism. There is another one. This came from Dennis Disher's group at Penn. He said that cells can exert traction, and it regulates this thing under the nuclear membrane called the nucleoskeleton, dominated by these proteins called the lamin family. And they're supposed to be important, if you thought of here's the nuclear membrane. They form a shell underneath the inner nuclear membrane, interact with all kinds of DNA. They're supposed to be important for controlling cell function. And people are really interested in this because you probably read about it. People with mutations in this lamin molecule get this rapid aging syndrome called progeria. Just from changing a single amino acid in this filaminous structure that sits underneath the inner nuclear membrane. But guess what? Intrigued us. We've known for a long time. People have made mouse models of lamin A mutant mice, and they look exactly like MT1 knockouts. They have the same funny teeth. They have the same defects in fat and bone that we've described before. This mouse, and it also is born looking normal, all dead in 40 days. You ca we cannot tell the difference. We've made the mice as well. They look exactly like MT1 and MP. This makes absolutely no sense. But guess what? We looked at lamin A in MT1 MMP knockout cells in 3D. And the MT1 knockout cells really have lower levels of lamin A. How can this be? Well, we think what it is is that the normal cancer cell exerts tractional force. That makes the lamin A level high. If you're MT1 deficient and you cannot exert tractional force, According to Dennis Disher, the cell will start to downregulate the lamin A level. So we think that's what's going on. It gets more interesting because, well, okay, so the cell decreases lamin A. What difference does that make? Well, it turns out we see huge changes in nuclear shape. In 3D, normal cells have these nice little bean-shaped nucleus. But the knockout cells, this is exactly what you see in the laminopathy patients, abnormally shaped nucleus. So when we delete MT1 MMP, the lamin levels go down, the same funny nucleus like you see in the lamin A. So we think this is a critical thing. I'm not going to go through it, but we find out it regulates transcriptional activity. So we come down to it now. So wait a minute, Steve. Let's go back to your model of the carcinoma. This is the last slide. Here is the carcinoma. Here's the surrounding stroma. We're staining for active beta-1 integrin. We can see that there are high levels some of it's in the tumor, some is in the surrounding stroma. Okay. What happens when we knock, what happens when we look at that yap taz? This is something that goes inside the nucleus, it makes the nucleus covered. So it turns out you can see high levels in the cancer and the stroma. That makes sense too. And if we look at the lamin A levels, the nuclei light up. So this is the normal cancer cell. It's got activated beta-1 integrin, it's got yap taz going into the nucleus, and it has nice nuclear lamin levels. What happened when we targeted MT1 MMP? Well, now we know. They didn't invade. But why are we getting these 1,000 gene changes? Oh, my gosh. The beta-1 integrin activation goes away in the cancer cells. All of a sudden, all of the YAP-TAS, instead of going into the nucleus, is now in the cytoplasm. 
And even more striking, the green is the lamin. The lamin levels seem to unbelievably decrease in the carcinoma. So we think this has completely changed the transcriptional program of our cancer cells. So this is it. 500 proteases, but guess what? MT1, I'm sorry, is the dominant paracellular collagenase. It works independently of all the other secreted guys. But I don't care if it's normal or neoplastic. It looks like it serves as a master regulator of these mechanotransduction pathways and transcriptional programs that are linked to the invasion program. So, of course, can't do this. I'm the minor figure here. People usually say, hey, wait a minute, you're wearing the same clothes that you had there? <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> he's got one outfit. Uh, but the people in the laboratory, actually, almost all the work on the branching morphogenesis and the cancer was done by Tamar Feinberg, who just left the lab to join Elaine Fuchs's lab at the Rockefeller, and the others play all kinds of different roles on their own projects. But that's it. Thank you for your rapt attention, and sorry for going over. Usually there's no questions. <laughs> sure. No. <laughs> Great question. Yeah, it's what triggers the cell to make MT1 MP in the first place? Nobody really knows. It's one of these guys that has no tata box. It has no easily identifiable sort of transcriptional elements that would really explain, you know, who would be binding to it. Some funny things do, but nobody really understands it. It looks to us like almost everybody makes MT1MP and that its dominant regulatory thing is moving it in those vesicles from inside the cell to the cell surface seems to be the dominant regulatory pathway. So it looks like it's independent of transcription. It's a great question. We just submitted a paper on this. Nobody cares. <laughs> Good, but we want to know what the answer is, because going, it doesn't make sense. And I got my big hint when I was at a Gordon conference a long time ago, and I was taught I'd never did any mouse work. This is all newer stuff that we've been forced to do. And I was talking to a mouse guy, and I said, you know, I'm really confused. We keep seeing more important roles for MT1 MMP. How come the mice are born? They're actually born looking pretty normal. How can this possibly be? And I go, it either means that our hypothesis is wrong, possible, why not? Or it means that the extracellular matrix of the developing mouse is completely different. And he looked at me like I was some kind of idiot. He goes, of course the extracellular matrix of the developing mouse is different. I'm going, well, how do you know that? He's going, it's very simple. This is kind of macabre, but this is what he told me. He goes, well, if you take a newborn mouse, you can pull its legs right off. But if you wait a week later, the legs won't come off if you pull as hard as you want. I don't ask him how he knew that. <laughs> so we started looking at this more carefully. And it actually happens that the bulk of type 1 collagen is born, is, is deposited one week after birth, right when the animals get sick. So through most of development, except for the aorta, and early bone rudiments, there's almost no type 1 collagen at all. So if you look in skin, which is one of the dominant places to find type 1 collagen, the newborn mouse has none. Seven days later, enormous amounts are deposited, and that's when the mouse gets sick. So the reason why the mice are born normal and escape all this lethal phenotype during development is there's very little collagen until the animal has to have a a mechanically strong extracellular matrix to um, respond to gravitational forces and mechanical movement. Because otherwise, you know, they're just kind of floating in utero. So it, it's a perfect correlation. Actually, the interesting one, I always go crazy on this stuff, is you go, what happens in a chick? I mean, the chick comes out of the egg and starts walking around immediately. But it's this very bizarre thing where it's really been looked at carefully is in chick tendons and ligaments. 
it actually has almost no structure. The ligaments and tendon, when it first came, comes out, and like one or two days later, they start making these enormous cross-link ligament tendon structures, but it's only after they come out of the egg, and it's the same in the mouse. So this collagen program of cross-linking, depositing, and making this big structure is later postnatal life. It's amazing. Or I could be wrong. Yeah. So we have no idea. Well, so I started my whole career working on neutrophils. Neutrophils move to every, you know, it's a part of the acute innate response. Neutrophils cross space membranes, move through tissues like there's no tomorrow. Turns out they have absolutely no MT1 MMP. And the reason why they can move so quickly through tissue is because they are not degrading when they want to move through. A few cells, like macrophages, do make MT1 MMP. But we don't know what that MT1 MMP is for. We have knocked out MT1 MMP in macrophages in vivo, trying to understand what function it might have in normal immune homeostasis or in this polyoma middle T model we have not been able to figure it out. We did publish another one where we found out that in macrophages, MT1MP seems to play a critical role in immune responses to LPS toll receptor signaling, but has nothing to do with its proteolytic activity. But we really don't know what MT1MP in immune cells like macrophages really, what it's really doing. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, no, no. Lots of papers saying, well, we find it too. They make MT1MP. I just don't, you know, I think of the simplest one. Look at that branching mammary gland. That branching epithelial cells really do make MT1MP in vivo but we knock it out and it branches just fine. What is it for? I have no idea. So even though MT1 can degrade things, it doesn't mean it always does. Even though macrophage is infiltrating at early lesions, you know, and they, the M2 phenotype is supposed to promote pro-metastatic, we study all these things. For the life of me, I cannot figure why the macrophage is making MT1 MMP. I don't know. Like I said, the more I work on this, the less I know. Yes. Yeah, so if you take MCF7 or T47D, they have no MT1 MMP. You actually, go ahead. Well, if I take an MCF7 cell and give it MT1 MP, it goes crazy. <laughs> But now we do know, uh-oh, it's changing thousands <laughs> of things in the transcript profile by changing cell shape, mechanotransduction pathways. So that's why I'm saying much more complicated than we had anticipated. Yeah, well, I said the more I know, the more I'm confused. <laughs> It's hard to know because the gradual increase is not at the transcriptional level. It's how much MT1MP traffics to the cell surface. And one of the problems is none of the antibodies, even though there are hundreds of papers looking at MT1 from pancreatic to colon to breast, I am not convinced that any of those antibodies are so good. But one of my friends that claims it is, he says that if you see a benign cancer lesion, that they are not making MT1MP at the protein level on the cell surface. If it's in situ, you know, DCIS, they don't see it. 
But the moment they start to see, frankly, invasive carcinomas where they're really invading, they're one they claim they see MT1MP protein in human tissue samples decorating the basal surface of those invading carcinoma cells. I'm just more temperate in my interpretation. I'm not sure. We've actually gone to the effort to make knock-in mice where we put an HA epitope into a knock-in mice to go, can I really see where MT1MP is? Because this polyoma middle T really does give you a very nice tumor progression model to really go, where is this stupid thing going during this program? Because I don't know. You know. Most people think they know all these answers. I'm telling you, there's hardly anything I'm sure of or I really know. <laughs>